Hi everyone, I'm Tara Tawa Windsor. I'm Schroeder Research Associate here um, in German at Cambridge. Um, and I'd just like to start by thanking you all for being here and also thank you to our audience um, participating on Zoom. I'm going to begin with a few uh, the thank yous. Um, first of all, many thanks to Jesus College Intellectual Forum for hosting the event, um, to the DAD Cambridge Hub for supporting it and also supporting the International Colloquium um, on the literary and essayistic writing of Sharon Dodua Otu that surrounds it. Um, also, many thanks to the cultural production and social justice team, Stephanie Galasso, uh, Miriam Schwartz, and Sarah Colvin, of course, for bringing us, uh, for instigating this and bringing us all together. And of course, huge thanks to Sharon and Mariam uh, for coming uh, to be here and for being the main event this evening. Before I hand over to you two, though, I'd just like to say a few words to introduce them. So our, our main guest of honour, Sharon Dorua Otu, is a prize-winning writer and cultural and political activist. She's written literary fiction in English and German, including novellas, uh, one named The Things I'm Thinking While Smiling Politely in 2012, and Synchronicity in 2015. Her short story, Herr Gottrup Set sich hin, won the Bachmann Prize in 2016. And last year, her first novel, Ardas Gaum, um, became a bestseller and sensation in Germany, um, and is going to be out in English next year, translated by John Cho Paluzzi. And Sharon will be reading from uh, some extracts from the translation this evening. Um, Sharon's currently here uh, as Schroeder writer in residence and also visiting fellow at Jesus College. Um, and this year she'll be curating a Black Literature Festival uh, under the title Gaza Nansen for the Ruhrfestspiele, um, which will take place from the 19th to the 21st of May 2022. Sharon will be in conversation with Mariam Aras, um, who is an expert in literature, politics and culture. She's currently completing her PhD thesis in Iranian and Islamic studies at the University of Bonn. She's also a public intellectual who regularly appears on the radio and in the media with contributions uh, on literature, gender, culture and politics, particularly in Iran and the Iranian diaspora. Um, so Sharon and Mariam are going to read and then speak about the book and there'll be time for um, questions at the end from the audience. And also if you'd like to ask a question on Zoom, then please use the Q&A section, uh, yeah, Q&A um, function. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Sharon and Mariam and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tara. And uh, of course, thank you, Sarah, for having us here and uh, for the invitation. So yeah, we all know why we are here at Jesus College or uh, our audience online, from wherever you're joining. Just before we start with the reading, um, what we are all waiting for, let me say just a few words about Sharon Duarte. The brilliant writer, the warm and wonderful person, and the inspiring activist. In her Schroeder lecture, Sharon talked about resonance. She showed a presentation with pictures of many juries of German literature awards, hats and participants of writing programs, editorial staff writers of the literature pages of major German newspapers. There were some friendly faces I also knew. In a few of these pictures, there was also Sharon smiling into the camera. All the other smiling figures were white, or at least they passed as white. I saw this presentation in late 2020 when Sharon showed it for the first time at Frankfurt's Textland Festival. It has stayed with me ever since, and I know with many others too who follow her work. How to find resonance as a black writer in this predominantly, predominantly white world of German literature? How to move through this space unafraid of working on her own writing and aesthetics, all the while the double consciousness described by W. E. Uh, du Bois, she also mentioned in her Schroeder lecture. After the publication of Adas Raum, you must have lived through many book events, read many reviews while thinking of Du Bois and how well you have captured also your state of being, seeing your perspective as a Black writer again marginalized through the wide gaze of criticism, 
and at the same time being able to analyze where lived experience that informs your writing comes from. We could actually speak here, I think, of a kind of double, double consciousness. <laughs> But we are also here tonight, of course, to celebrate the beauty of your writing. And, and I think it's safe to say many readers are doing this with us already. And you actually gained deep resonance with a lot of them. And if you follow Sharon on social media, you can tell this is true. Um, sometimes this resonance also came from unexpected places. But I think mostly from a readership that is very different from these kinds of uh, literature order um, that we experience in a lot of yeah, the German media. Um, you also said in your shorter lecture, only through when my writing is read and discussed does my wish become an agenda. And I think about the entanglement of aesthetics and agenda and the way they actually belong together. Um, I hope <laughs> we're going to talk about it tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, so we're talking about the translation also tonight and we're going to read for the first time from the translation made by John Chopulisi. Um, and yeah, just a quick question before we hear you read. Mm -hmm. how, how was the, I think you've already answered this a couple of times, but now that actually the translation um, has been finished and is about to be published, right? Yeah. It's it's now going through the process of editing and discussing and the fine tuning, but yes, yeah, it's the finish. Yeah. yeah. So what, what is your feeling? How does it differ from the publication of the German other stuff? Yeah. For me, um, the translation is a completely different work <laughs> because <clears throat> what I can say is when I wrote Adas Raum, I wasn't just trying to come up with a plot. I wasn't just trying to come up with some figures that the reader gets to know on page one and follows with bated breath until they get to page 350 or whatever. I was also trying to do an intervention with the German language itself. I was trying to use the German language in a specific way to pursue an aim. So at the moment in Germany, um, a lot of political debates happen around um, language has become, or well, probably always was contested, but it's become again contested specifically to do with what they call Diskriminierungsarmerschwache, or language that's not as discriminatory as normal. Can art be discrimination free? And um, a lot of writers have been very defensive about the German language and wanted to retain this, I don't know what you'd call it, authentic, German um, voice and and I am one of those writers who claim it must be possible to create beautiful art but not necessarily not reproduce racist and sexist language. So Adas Ram for me was also an intervention to say I think it can be done and I want to try. This aim is not going to come across in English. There will be elements that will shine through I I, I suppose because of the figures and because of the, the plots. Um, but the, let's say the ingredients that John has to work with as a translator are different to the ingredients that I had. So I, I consider Ada's Realm to be a new work and a new uh, yeah, literary creation. And I'm excited to read it myself. So I'm reading it and yeah. thinking about it, but it will be another um, experience to have hold it in my hand as a published book. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so shall we get started? We get started. Shall I just begin with um, yeah. one of the extracts that I brought Yeah, down. just uh, tell us quickly where are we in the novel? I'm going to begin on page one. Okay. So the novel is um, 
I won't say too much about the plot right now, but what I will say is it's a novel that works very happily with the element of surprise. <laughs> and what we find on page one is we're given a name, Ada, Ada, and then we're given a place and a date. So the place is Tutupi, which is a, um, an area in West Africa, and the date is March 1459. And then the story begins and the reader will be thrown straight into the action. During the longest nights of the year, blood clung to my forehead and my baby died at last. He had whimpered in his final moments and Nalani had caressed his cheek. How lovely, I had thought, that this would be his final memory. She lay just beside him, the child between us, and her head resting on my own. Nalani's eyes shimmered as she assured me that it would not be much longer now. God willing. She whispered because all of our mothers were sleeping on the other side of the room, but Nalamli's voice would have given out at any moment anyway. Together we had cried and prayed at my baby's side the last three nights. I could barely hear her, and I understood her even less. While she caressed him, she had stared at me as if surprised by my confusion. Though the words, how would you know, never left my lips. In an already unbearable situation, this moment was particularly absurd. Nala Mali always knew, but in that moment in which it was quite literally a matter of my own flesh and blood, I did not want to seem clueless to her. And so to distract myself, I scratched my forehead, scratching and forgetting I had blood under my nails. The few candles Nala Mali had gathered and placed before the doorway flickered. It was this way with Kofi too, she breathed softly, as if she did not wish to disturb my son while he was dying. Shame on me. This was not so long ago. The ensuing silence resulting from my shame and her sympathy accompanied us through the final tortured breaths. The candles wept. Outside, Nalani had prepared a tiny pad of palm leaves to lay him out on in the moonlit courtyard. She spread a white cloth over this. There was no grave. The boy did not even have a name. He was only five days old. And yet he had tarried still longer than my first child, also a boy. He had opened his eyes immediately after birth, looked around himself, and evidently he had not liked what he had seen. That little one had left us before I could even take him in my arms. Nalamle squeezed my hand once, quickly, then shifted to her knees and stood. I wanted to as well, but with great effort, I only managed to make it halfway, merely a squat. It was about time to carry out his body. I stayed on the floor. She bent over one of the flames. I stayed on the floor. She blew out one candle, then the next, and then another. Finally, she lifted the baby's body and carried him from our room. I stayed on the floor. The darkness comforted me. Through the open doorway, I watched how Nala Mli weighed my baby in her arms, how she laid his body gently down onto the palm leaves, how she adjusted his head lovingly, pressing his lips together, how she blinked her tears away. I leaned back against the wall, closed my own eyes, and dozed off. That's beautiful. Um, yeah, so when you read this English text, is it, what is it to you? You just said it's an entirely new work of art. Yeah. But of course, it's still, it's still your story. Yeah, <laughs> close in other words. So I recognize, of course, uh, the story. And it's interesting because I've had this experience before uh, with a different text that I wrote, the short story, this text has also been translated from the German original into English, actually into two, in, into British English and US American English. So I had this experience once before where I was reading a text that I had written in one language um, that had been translated into my first language. It's kind of, <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of bizarre. I very much admire the translators who, who have taken that task on. Um, 
Yeah, and it's an odd experience for me to read those texts because I worked so hard to find the exact right German words to express this thing. And sometimes I, I didn't only think about the vocabulary, but I thought about a whole plot to describe something which works in the German context. So for example, in the short story, Herr Grotjub sets sich hin, um, there's a married couple who argue about how long it takes to boil an egg. So I was told when I read the English translation in the United States that in the States, that cultural argument would be about how strong the coffee is. Mm -hmm. And I guess in Britain, it might be about how long you should toast the bread. I don't know. So I'm thinking if I had, if I'd written the story in English, I would have chosen other images, right? So it's always like a, a bit of a jarring moment. I'm reading and I'm enjoying it. But I'm thinking, wait a minute, I wrote something different, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that has it also to do with, you also um, said in your Schroeder lecture that it's an odd experience that you now come back <laughs> yeah. here to the UK totally ironic, yeah. to be celebrated as a <laughs> fiction writer while you were actually going to Germany. Um, where you were kind of, yeah, how, how did you put it? Uh, I mean, you were a complete Ausländer. Yeah. So, <laughs> so what I, yeah, I talked about these feelings of alienation, right? This yes. uh, double consciousness of feeling like I was growing up in the UK and knowing that I didn't quite 100% count as an English person. There's always this sort of background noise, disturbance, like, oh, it's, it doesn't quite fit. And I imagined that, you know, I had talked about in my lecture resonance, and I thought one of the things that I was looking to do in Germany was to experience resonance, right? But I wasn't, it was an, something slightly contradictory. I was looking to experience the resonance of being like a real foreigner. <laughs> so I really, really do not belong. I'm not just kind of hearing an irritation, but actually when I'm in Germany, people say, where do you come from? And I say, I come from Britain, you know? And then they say, where do you really come from? That whole thing is all like, yes, this is, this is what I know of the field, <laughs> to be correct. Um, and it's super ironic that I go to Germany and then I, I do my political activism based on this, you know, feeling of not belonging. And I write my literature as an intervention. And then um, some people in England, my country of birth, say, oh, we like what you're doing. <laughs> they, <laughs> they, they write clever articles about it, analyzing it. And they, they do understand me. I went away thinking that, England didn't understand me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's really ironic. And now you have, but you also, of course, have this kind of mixed resonance in, in Germany. I mean, actually, you have, as I said, really deep resonance. I mean, you have, you have a readership. Yeah. You have, you have a whole community. Um, I think you said Adas Raum is also, in, especially in the last part, the community novel. Yes, yes. I went for um, a story. So I think a lot of the sort of Western storytelling is about following the process of a single hero or heroine. I really think it's actually that binary as well when I think about it. And, um, and we follow the life and adventures of a certain single figure. And I was trying to imagine what would a literature look like that didn't perpetuate this notion of as there's only one person who makes it, one person experiences this hardship and manages to go through. So in Adas Ram, I tried to show that Ada is always in a community. There's always other people with her and around her supporting her, maybe also people she has an antagonistic relationship with, but this always happens in a, in a community. And there's also always um, a very close friend or a sister figure. Um, and it was my attempt to show that this is how I also think of, um, I think of activism that way too, that um, one thing that activists are striving to do is to build community. So they act in community and they're trying to create community. And how can you, I, I'm not sure if I managed to achieve it with others around, but that was what I was going for. So trying to write a novel which foregrounded uh, how important community is. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think it does. Um, and you already did it in that first part in 1459. Yeah. So that was a really good bridge to the back to the text. What um, 
yeah, what kind of relationship do we see here? So this is a kind of sister relationship mm -hmm. of the um, first Ada mm -hmm. character. Mm -hmm. um, and what kind of community does she move? And you have the, yes, the, the, sis, the sister figure, but you are also um, embedding those two women into a bigger community of yeah. not only but mostly women. Yeah. What kind of social structures are involved? What I wanted to what one thing when I was writing this novel, I thought it's got to tick some boxes. One of the boxes I wanted to tick was to um so in my, my talk on Monday I talked about the literary imagination literary imagination. And one of the things I think happens in um German literary imagination is unfortunately African characters are either non-existent or they exist in a very, yeah, they're usually sort of primitive or, or somehow we have to feel sorry for them or some, something like this happens, right? So I wanted to insert into German writing with this or contribute to German writing African characters who exist before colonial lists arrive on the coast of West Africa and are living, breathing, um, I would say, handelnde figuren, which is um, characters that actually have agency. Um, these are, this is a community of women who, uh, they, we, they clearly love each other, they laugh together, they cook together, but they also kind of um, tease each other, kind of horrible to, to Ada, actually Ada's just lost her baby and they still managed to make fun of her even though she's suffering. Um, but these are realistic as far as I could imagine what was going on in 15th century West Africa. These are realistic people. Um, they're not these noble, what do they call it? Noble Africans or whatever they call it. So um, I thought a lot about what should happen in this opening scene. And I thought one of the things um, I wanted was a, a, a feeling of uh, history, that there is a history that, that precedes the arrival of um, Portuguese. Then I also wanted to show that um, there were what we would now call same-sex relationships at that time. This is something that's kind of been lost. It's kind of, <clears throat> um, I read a little bit about gender in pre-colonial West Africa, and I think it also happened in other societies where the roles were not really so strictly divided according to gender, but it was more like gender roles like, um, if a man died and he was married and had children, then maybe his whatever older sister would then marry his widow and continue to run the farm and so on. So it's just about who's who's got the roles and, and what do they do with that power. Um, and I wanted to introduce this figure into to the novel. Um, I was surprised that people didn't comment on it that much. I was expecting a lot of blowback from that, and maybe it will happen with the English translation, because at this moment in time, we have, for example, um, LGBTQ communities in, in, in Ghana really being repressed, right? And being um, harassed, being um, jailed, uh, their, their, their protests are being uh, criminalized. And they are told that um, being gay, being lesbian, being queer is un-African. So one of the things I wanted to show with that as well, as well that's, wrong right <laughs> and I'm interested I'm, it's going to be really interesting when this book comes out in English I think to see what happens whether people um can yeah that, whether that's helpful let's say or whether I'll, I'll be criticized for it which I could imagine and maybe both will happen mm -hmm. yeah 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 but that's one really um less looked upon side of colonialism that you yes. brought into your story yes and when I first wrote that scene there was a kind of a discussion about whether I would explain, yeah? So there's a, there's a same-sex couple and, and it was on my mind. Someone said to me, you need to explain how come there's a lesbian couple in, in the beginning of the book. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna at some point comment on the fact that they, you know, this did happen. Everything that I just said, I was gonna put in the book somehow, but it didn't fit. There wasn't, there wasn't a natural part in the, in the narrative where I could just slip in all this knowledge. <laughs> And then I thought, why should I explain it? Either it works or it doesn't, you know, either. Uh, and, and I also thought, who does it work for, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I assume that for people who are queer, when they read that, they feel affirmed, right? And 
And for people who think homosexuality is un African, then they have a problem, but then I don't mind, then they should have a problem. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was there any discussion with your editor at the uh, with your publishing house? Yeah, that was to explain. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, that was that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. I actually remember one review which got it wrong. Okay. I think yeah. What it was something? Say? I think uh, they talked about. Um, marriage with, I don't know what the English term is right now, sorry, um, with multiple women. Yeah, polyamorous. Uh, yeah. Uh, poly, poly something. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, that was really interesting. Oh, that's what happened. Okay. Yes. I, I didn't see that, but I didn't understand. Okay. Now I understand. And I, yeah, wow, at first I thought, okay, I got it wrong, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you can read it, you know, the reader can interpret it that way. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but what I find really striking in this first part, and um, which I think also the translation transports really well, is this kind of tenderness. Um, between Ada and um, Nada. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you see this translated, traveled into the new text? The tenderness? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I agree with you. I think, um, so when I was, describing this scene when I was in the process of writing it, what I tried to do was to imagine how it would feel to be. I've, I've not been in that situation. Um, I've never, I, in fact, many of the experiences that I write about in Adam's realm, I haven't. Been, so I've never had an abortion. I've never had a child die just after it was born or anything in that way. So I was trying to access feelings which I would not have experienced one-to-one, -one, but I imagined that perhaps what I could imagine what um, grief felt like and the kind of grief that is so devastating that you just don't know what to do, that I could maybe transport that feeling of grief from other things that I had experienced. So I, I, I wasn't trying to reproduce an exact feeling of what this specific um, uh, plot point was, but I was trying to, transport the emotion mm -hmm. and I, I what I did was I yeah I used things like um the way that their body language I described their body mm -hmm. language or or the way that the, the how whether they're whispering or speaking softly um and how I imagined your brain works like you start to remember things and you, you know you make linkages to different things that have happened and also there was something else I was going to say <coughs> um yeah, I thought about what the scene looks like. So they're in a specific room. What was the light like? What was the moonlight um, outside? And the candles. And then I came up with this one line, the candles were crying. I, I don't remember in, in German, I said something else. And then John's translated that. And all of that still somehow works. That I, you know, um, that's quite amazing that that's, that's being retained, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so um, what is actually in, um, in this life of the first Ada, um, is the creature, what's, what, what's its name in, in the English translation of Wesen, of the creature? Is it creature? No, I don't think so. I don't remember. 100%, but I would have said being. The being, okay, yeah. okay, yes. Um, yeah, so it changes from, uh, from the first Ada to the second one in um, Stratford Nouveau, mm -hmm. where it becomes a doorknob. Yes. And um, yes, so I think we should. Um, get to the second scene mm -hmm. and maybe you can 
tell us a bit about the being? Yes, I can do that. And the way it connects. Unfortunately, the bit that I chose to read isn't the being, yes, but it's yes. okay. Um, <laughs> we can still talk about Stratford de Beau in London in 1848. That's where the so the beginning of the novel introduces the reader to three different um, geographical areas that are also in very different time periods. And the first period I read from was West Africa in uh, 1459, pre-colonial West Africa. And then we have um, 19th century England, 1848, so that's the time of the revolutions in Europe. And there was sort of this tension in London about whether that was going to happen mm -hmm. uh, in England also. And then the last one, which I'm not going to read from today, but the last one would be um, 1945 in Nazi Germany in a concentration camp. And they, that makes up the first half of the novel. And then the next half of the novel takes place in 2019. So yeah, in 1848, we meet another female figure who has the name Ada, or Ada in this case. And in the scene that I'm just about to read, again, the reader is thrown straight in. In fact, this time it's even more confusing because you're going from this very tragic, um, um, dramatic tale of a woman who's, whose baby has just died after childbirth, and this scene in uh, 1459 in West Africa. And then the first, so there's a, the last sentence in that section is broken in half. And the first half of the sentence is still in 1459 and the second half of the sentence, all of a sudden you're in 1848 in Stratford Lebeau. And it doesn't make that much sense while you're reading it, but then slowly it unravels and you begin to understand who these people are. It's um, a woman and her lover. Um, and they're kind of having this war, actually. Um, <clears throat> and I'll just begin reading and then I'll explain a little bit afterwards what's going on. Da, 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 da. Okay. Strapped in the bow, March 1848, I glanced back at him while he dressed, first the stockings, then the trousers, never the other way round, then his undershirt shaken out two times. He worried otherwise that his overshirt would not sit properly. The tips of his elegant fingers encircled the buttons one after the other, and he quivered with rage, chair shy. I could have avoided this argument if I had merely conceded to agree with him unconditionally, and I often did, because especially in those days, it had become exceedingly exhausting to quarrel with men like Shah. Men who actually considered themselves to be the good ones, and yet between the blacks on one side and the women on the other, never knew where to expect the next challenge to their God-given authority and therefore fought preemptively on every front at once. The confidence with, with which he had presumed to tell me something of probability theory was actually quite comical. It would seem the constricting impact of a corset affected both men and women alike. I kept my commentary, darling, what actually goes on in that little head of yours, to myself and counted silently to 10. He held out one of my calculations for the analytical engine in his hand, reading glasses spans on the tip of his nose. Mm. He tapped on one of the lines of his index finger, perhaps it had been rather asconchable of me not to acknowledge him at once. You've made an error here, he said. There's a missing comma. I examined the spots without turning my head and then returned my gaze to him. I decided on the response. Thank you, my dear. I sat at my writing desk, quill pen in hand, and dipped the nib into my inkwell. As soon as an analytical engine exists, it will necessarily guide the future course of the science. I apprehended the missing comment. He had nodded, removing his reading glasses and cleaning them with his cotton handkerchief. And what precisely does analytical signify in this context? I remember looking up at him and misinterpreting his earnest stare. Admittedly, my subsequent lecture was a bit long-winded. His eyes had glazed over by the time I arrived at my conclusion. One day, we will even be able to compose music with it, I had raved. The applications are limitless. 
What had prevented him from simply delighting in this with me? What a pitiful little man, I thought, how he toyed sulkily with his goatee as he counted. If what you're describing were possible, it would already have been developed by a scientist. If I had merely kept my peace, we could have continued lying together side by side in the warmth of my bed. But after a certain point, even the last spark of artificial humility fizzles out. Yes, I had nodded, you're quite right. I am that scientist. His cheeks had flushed. In answer to his question as to what I meant by this, I had simply looked away, lowering my gaze. And of course, that had not sufficed as an apology for shy. I rose from my writing desk as he turned away and began to pull on his trousers with great the theatrical gesticulations. I know I should have said something. I struggled to find the proper words, but I did not want to show how much his outburst had amused me. My forehead began to itch precisely at that moment when his faith in me began to erode away once more. It was, for the umpteenth time, the beginning of the end. Thank you. <laughs> That's brilliant. And what is so interesting here in this um, passage is that you, that's my interpretation, kind of bring together the self-confident character of Ada Lovelace yeah. with the kind of generational knowledge of the traveling Ada. Yeah. Is that more or less correct? I try to. And at that point in 1848, the reader begins to feel that there is a continuity. Mm -hmm. There's some hints which can be picked up on. But I would say the figure doesn't know it yet. The figure is kind of just doing these things and saying these things. But we don't, I, I would say that Ada Lovelace in 1848 doesn't learn yet about mm -hmm. these continuities. Yeah. Okay. But she, 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 she feels it. Yeah, she feels it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's really, um, that's so well done. And this is also, I think, why you can reread and reread your novel. Yes. Because you will pick up then more of the bits and pieces and the seeds yes. that you. Um, I once joked about that because I said this costs 22 euro, which I think is a lot of money. Yeah, <laughs> money's worth it. <laughs> 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 Very true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So tell us a bit about how how you structured that figure of Ada Lovelace, of the historical figure, and um, how you developed this particular tone yeah. and language of Lady Ada. Lady Ada. It's a it's a challenge to write because. Um, Somebody, when I was writing the novel still, another person, um, a friend, a writer friend of mine told me that she really admired Ada Lovelace as a, a, a real life historical figure and always thought that, oh, I can't write a novel about her. She's just too amazing. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's a challenge to write that. And especially because I kind of borrow her. I don't really, I mean, I write about a day in her life, right? It's of course a fictional day. The, the um, person that that scene describes that she's in um, this antagonistic love relationship with is Charles Dickens, actually, and I made that up, right? And <clears throat> so I've got this fictional day with a fictional love affair, um, and in my, it's hard to talk about this book without spoiling it, but never mind. <laughs> in my story, Ada Lovelace dies a lot earlier than she does in real life. <laughs> And, um, but these were all, there, there was a reason I did that, um, that doesn't always, I, not everybody agrees with what I did. I, I got told off for doing this actually one time. I was given, <laughs> it was so funny. I was given a reading and the man who was moderating me kind of went, you shouldn't have killed her. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm okay, okay. But then, uh, the reason, there's two things that happened. One thing is I took the real life historical figure. Why did I do that? Because I wanted to 
um, show a specific story about patriarchy and how um, women in, in 19th century England negotiated patriarchy. Um, so my, my novel is a lot about experiencing discrimination and uh, resistance, about how you actually resist that and how that resistance looks. And in, in this um, page that I just read, you, you see that she uses very subtle uh, means to try to, to maintain her well, status as a thinking human being. Um, and she chooses her battles and so on. So I wanted to, to do that. And it, it was important to be able to do that, to have a figure who was a mathematical genius kind of in dialogue with um, an artist. Mm -hmm. I make fun of the fact that Charles Dickens is a writer. I meant that in a playboy, but I think I got told off for doing that too. <laughs> so you've got this mathematical genius as a woman. And what I wanted was for that to be undisputed that that could have happened. Mm -hmm. I could have written it with a different name or a fi completely fictional, but I think some people would have said, no, 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 that couldn't have happened. There weren't such women in 19th century. Because yeah. we do not have them in the history books, right? And actual fact, the love letter was a genius. Her mother was a genius. The private maths teacher that was hired to teach Ada Lovelace was also a genius. There were other women at the time who were doing really fantastic work on like research into to, um, what well, it ended up being space travel kind of thing. So there were these women there, but we just don't know about them in now. So I thought to, to avoid that that becomes a discussion of whether that's realistic, I'm going to put her name in there. That was a, a hack that worked for that part of the novel, but maybe we can talk about that later. There were other things that I, I put into the novel, um, which were real, let's say, real stories, but because it wasn't in the life experience of the people reading the novel, like, no, that would not happen, and yeah. it was dismissed. But anyway, that was the reason why I chose Ada Lovelace as a realistic, as a name. Mm. And then, the reason I fictionalized it was because it wasn't that important. It's, a, it, it's not a historical novel. I'm not trying to tell an accurate history of what happened in 1459, and 1840, and 19. How big would that be? <laughs> I'm trying to tell us, I'm trying to do a, a thought experiment on how history um, isn't just a, a linear thing that happens, that happens then, and then it gets better, and then and look how advanced we are now. But I'm trying to say history is something that moves in um, a loop. It's like not just a circle and we're going round and round in circles and not getting anywhere, but we have the opportunity to transform. We, we experience similar things and how can we make different choices to transform that situation? So it's important then that this figure is a fictional figure to do this thought experiment. And that's why there's a certain plot where the three um, women all sharing the name of Ada or Ada, they all go through a similar process where they experience a very violent death. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that's the first half of the novel. And then they have the chance, another chance in 2019. Um, that's, that's what I was doing with that. Yeah. And this kind of loop also includes, um, yeah, very kind of shifting power structures. Yes. For example, in this case, in, in the Ada Lovelace um, narration, as you said, Ada Lovelace is negotiating um, pa patriarchy mm -hmm. in, in her times. Yeah. Um, but she is also, well, she's a representative of her class. That's so, right. Yes. And there's the other female figure um, with which you paired her, yeah. Lizzie, mm -hmm. her maid. And that's right. That's good that you said that. That was also important to me that <clears throat> um, I really wanted to show that each of the figures were rounded figures, which they both, they do problematic things. And then they also have to negotiate experience discrimination, but this is not a contradiction. They do both. And I think it comes up clearest mm. in 1848. In 1848, we, we see that she's a genius and she's having to deal with this man who thinks he can correct her maths and he knows nothing about maths. Um, but who doesn't know that experience? <laughs> and then, um, and then, and then you, you see her with her quite problematic relationship to her maid and how she, as an English woman, acts towards somebody who's um, 
Irish and has lost her entire home and family. She only has a brother left from her whole family. And that was a deliberate move to just to say that these, these things are not a contradiction, they go together and often. Right? Yeah. And one of the things that really, yeah, I, I, I guess I can say I really was upset about when um, Adas Brown first came out and was being discussed in the foyer of the German language um, literature circles. It was uh, people who I guess had been expecting me as a person who says I'm a black writer and I'm against racism. <laughs> they expected me to write a novel which was against white people or against white men. <laughs> and then they read this novel and saw um, the male characters behaving in a certain way and the women being killed in a violent way and so on. And they assumed that it was a very uh, sort of simple tale mm -hmm. of how all women are treated badly and all men are evil or what have you. So I was very sad about that because then it missed that there are male characters in the novel that aren't evil. Anyway, I didn't intend to write evil male characters in the first place, but yes, there were some men in the novel who, who do do violent things. And there are other men in the novel who are also resisting against the discrimination that they experience. That got missed in, in that reading. And they also missed the reading that Ada Lovelace herself was perpetuating violence. So I felt very sad about that. Yeah. Yes. Maybe we can um, discuss this also <coughs> later on. Maybe we'll have some question about this. Yeah, this is this um, strange notion of activism and writing, yeah. or literary activism um, in Germany, which is somehow different in, um, I don't know, in all, but many realms of the English-speaking world. Um, and this was something um, which was mentioned quite a bit mm -hmm. in, in a negative way yeah. in reviews of uh, Adas Brown. Yeah. And um, yes, this is something which Curiously, are uh, mostly black writers or writers of color accused of. Um, well, they, the main, the main um, criticism or assessment of those writers, non-whites, <laughs> is that uh, they're doing something autobiographical. They're talking about themselves. Yes. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know. Yes, not. This yeah. is the interesting thing. So it's actually, it's it's about perspective. And it's about delegitimizing non-white perspectives. Yeah. Yes, I think. And uh, yeah, so. And it was so frustrating. I would go to readings um, of other authors who had also uh, published novels at that time. So my novel came out spring 21. Um, and I would I saw interviews of uh, Vitu Sanya, who wrote mm -hmm. Identity, also. A debut novel, and I would attend readings, for example, from Sheikh Abadia, Drei Kamaradin. And it was really fascinating to me how these works, which are, are doing so much, they're doing so many different things on so many different levels, but they were constantly be switches to, yeah, this is really autobiographical. You're telling us your story in this fictional tale. And I'm like, that's not how I read what they wrote. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but this has somehow come to be the, uh, this is, uh, yeah, this autofictional auto -fiction, yeah. writing yeah. has somehow uh, come to be this, uh, yeah. It's good that you mentioned yeah. that word because I want to know if it's possible for non-white people to write autofiction. And the reason I asked that, you know why I'm asking that. <laughs> Because I realize that white writers write auto fiction and non white writers write identity something, identity. Okay. Politics. That's my mm -hmm. thesis. And it was really like, why? Yes, it's true. That's true, actually. There we go. Academics in the room. <laughs> Is it possible <laughs> for black people to write auto fiction? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think this is a good point in time to open the floor for questions for you from our audience in presence and online. Um, yes, so I don't know, Tara, are there any online questions? No, Sorry. yeah, but um, I would encourage people to go ahead and use the QA. Okay, then I think I've seen the first time. 
You got to wait for a mic. <laughs> Um, thank you for um, the talk. It was really interesting. I'm just wondering if there's a sentence in your like a phrase that you've written that you're most proud of that you're sort of like, "Well, this is really beautiful." Okay. Um, in in uh, in the German original. Uh, yeah. This is all oh, any. Like, any yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, I honestly don't know if there's the one that is the one, I, I don't think I've got one that is the sentence to be all sentences. Although I do have a title that I think is the title to be all titles. And that is the things I'm thinking while smiling politely. I'm never gonna write anything better than that. <laughs> but the, the sentence I can think of right now because it came up just now in the workshop today was, um, I, um, it goes, in German, meine Mutter und ich, wir haben uns teilen können. And in German, it has a double meaning. My mother and I, we can share each other, or my mother and I, we can separate. And I really like, when I wrote it first, I was like, oh, <laughs> that's nice. And it's a shame because it can't, it can't really be translated in the way that I would like it to sound to convey what it was doing in German. Hello, thank you. Um, so I was really intrigued by the first excerpt that you read, the opening of the novel. Uh, I thought it was a really, well, I guess for someone who has PTSD to listen to that was really kind of consoling in a way. Um, even though obviously, like I know that I can't relate relate beyond my experiences, um, but that just made me think because I'm interested in how poetry in particular, but also other literary art forms, um, can bear witness to traumatic experiences and grief, as you mentioned. And personally, I find quite because um, to us, like it's a bit like personal, but I find quite annoying, like when people like relate. Um, only like to me through the prism of trauma rather than anything else. And um, I was just curious if you had any particular writers or, or models that expect that they influenced you to write about these difficult experiences as they pertain to the topics of your novel, not to overgeneralize obviously trauma. Yeah, thank you for, for that. Thank you for that question. It reminds me, um, <clears throat> I, I do, I, I, um, I've made no secret of this. My absolute favorite author is Toni Morrison and she does that and she, um, so my, the first novel I wrote, read of Toni's was um, Beloved and she, she wrote this premise, which is mind blowing. And it's based on a true story even that there was a woman who had run away, she was an enslaved woman who'd run away, escaped, and was uh, being pursued by her, her owners. And she was running away with two of her children and she was also pregnant. No, she was with three, anyway. A number of children and she was pregnant and she's trying to get away from these people and she knows that they're gonna catch up with her. <clears throat> and so what she does rather than a risk all of them being caught and all of them being enslaved again. She tries to kill her children. And in Beloved, she, Beloved is the name of the child that she did kill. It's like a ghost that comes back. Um, and just as an aside, that story, um, the reason that Toni Morrison wanted to write about that story was because it was a newspaper article that reported on that story. And the premise of the article was would this woman be tried for destruction of property or murder? Because of course it's tricky if she's gonna be tried for murder, then that means that they are real people, you know? It, it, it was mind blowing. And so Toni Morrison, what she does with this really traumatic story is she makes the characters human and she gives them, she gives them a backdrop, she gives them a story, she gives, she gives them a future actually in, in the book as well. And there's one specific thing that she did that 
of the many things she did in that. But one time she wrote, she described the scars on the main character's back, Sete, her name is, her, her back is covered in scars from whippings. And she describes it as a tree. She said, you've got a tree in your back and there's blossoms. And I thought that that captures exactly what I would like to be able to do as a writer, to take something traumatic and to turn it into art so that the story is given back to us as a way that we can, yeah, we, we keep our story, we keep our history and we keep our humanity or regain our, our humanity. And um, the motto at the beginning of Adas Realm is, is a, a reference to this need to go back to our history and reclaim our history and, and bring it into the present. So that's what I wanted to do. And what I wanted to do also is not just, you know, I'm not a fan of, like I don't watch horror movies and actually I, I become, the older I get, the less I'm able to tolerate depictions of violence. Weirdly enough, when you read my book, you wouldn't believe that, but I don't want to just depict violence like um, and, and, and exploit that. What I try to do is to acknowledge that it did happen so that the word witness is really important in your question. I try to acknowledge that this is something that we experienced, we humanity, let's say. Um, and to have a, to introduce a perspective on the things that we experienced that allow us to remember it and commemorate it maybe, um, pay, pay, yeah, bear witness that it happened and to integrate it into our present day. Yeah, so I'm grateful for that question. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, so since there are some online questions. Yeah, we have a question from Jeanette. Mm -hmm. Hello, Jeanette. <laughs> uh, she asks, in German, in German studies in Germany, there are seminars on Afro-German literature at the moment and Adas Kaum is being read. How do you feel about being categorised as an Afro-German author? Oh, I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm super excited that it's happening at all, that in German, what, what would she call it, German, German studies? Yeah, in German studies in Germany. German studies in Germany. It's amazing, I think. This is a revolution. And I think it's a relatively new development because I've been writing in Germany, not always in German, but I've been writing um, texts that are relevant to Germany, let's say, for 10 years. And 10 years ago, it was the uh, German studies department in, in the States that were inviting me to give talks and presentations and so on. And they were studying my Aileen, Ulumide Popola or Philip Kabukupsa and um, Noah So. And I kept thinking, okay, so why are we flying all the way to Washington or wherever we're going? What's happening in Frankfurt or Freiburg or so? So the, this that I'm hearing, um, that Adas Ram is being read is just, it's really amazing. So how do I feel about being Afro-German? It's, it's a tricky, it is, it's not something that I wear easily. And the reason that is, there's two reasons. Um, I was not born and socialized in Germany. So although I could be in practice Afro-German, I would, I would have called myself German even without citizenship simply because I live in Germany. I contribute to German things and German things affect me. So I have a kind of non-paper-based understanding of, of being German. But now by now, because of Brexit, which we will discuss in public, um, <laughs> I have also got German citizenship. So I am literally German as well. But, but, and I'm, I hope I can find the right words to describe this. I am somebody who accident, I would claim accidentally became an Afro-German author or a German uh, language author. It happened because of this prize awarded for the short story I wrote that wasn't intended to be an intervention into German literature, it was written for another purpose. And then as chance would have it, I was invited to take part in the competition and then history happened. But when that happened, I think I would claim that what happened was um, mm, it left it left white German literary the world white German literature intact. I was added in as a British 
funny, you know, oh, she's coming from Britain and doing this thing on Lorio, but everything else was left intact. And so I'm really aware of the fact that there's, a, there's an aspect of me being here where I am, which reinforces a kind of, um, there is no, you know, and it, it can contribute to making authors who are black Germans and have been writing in German their whole lives and been socialized and born and raised in Germany, like, it can contribute to, to erasing them a little bit. Um, I write German in a specific way and I consciously write it in that way to try to say not everybody who writes in German writes it from this um, um, native language perspective. But it could be read as, oh, all black people are not really German. Do you see what I mean? And I'm really nervous about that. So I, I, I claim Afro-German for political reasons, but I also want it to have an asterisk on so that I can still bring in a wide range of people also. And so I'm, I'm not satisfied yet with the status quo and I'm constantly trying to, yeah, hold the door open, let's say, yeah. <laughs> Um, just to follow on, there's a comment from Christian there who says, in, in Freiburg, we discuss Alice Rahm in the English department, post-colonial literature in the widest sense. Wow. Well, broader context. And there are more questions here. Yeah. Yeah. I can ask a question. Uh, um, so I've been meaning to ask you for ages. Oh, you need a mic, I think. Uh, Something I've been meaning to ask for ages is about your double role as an essayist and political commentator and as a literary writer, which are two completely different things. Um, yeah, and I guess I'm interested in a way in the functionality of both things, that being a political commentator and an essayist does something, being a literary writer does something. The things they do, as I look at them as an outsider, don't look to be entirely different, but they're very, very different media that you're doing them in. So I'd just love to hear more about how you see those two roles. Mm. Yes. <laughs> I think I think what I'm doing with those two roles is mm, now that you've asked the question, I, I realized that I'm doing it. Is so I have a, a role which is the writer. And in an ideal world, I could just write. That would actually be what I would do. And, and I would write, and then I would have people who read and they would engage with it, and they wouldn't do this. Oh, she's writing about evil white men and noble women who are suffering. But they'll be like, oh, okay, I see, you know, and they would engage with it in whatever way, but just, yeah. But because there is this, this um, th there aren't that many other black German language writers being published um, and being received. There are some, I don't want to say there are none, um, but because you can still count them on one hand, right? It's, it's still a big burden of represent, uh, representation that each individual writer then carries. So for example, when I was writing Adas Raum, I thought very hard about whether the, the, the boyfriend partner at the end of the novel 2019, who does something which is very problematic, very problematic. I thought very hard about whether it could be a black man or whether I would make it a white man, because how many black male figures are there in German language literature? You can count them on one finger. You know, that can say <laughs> maybe more, but you say it's, it was super difficult. and. And I think the problem came because there just weren't any or weren't many of them. And if the more there are, then the easier that burden of representation becomes. We share it over many more shoulders. So what I do with the essay writing is to try to affect that context and try to make a change in the context. So I write what I want to write actually as a literary author where I'm like really going into my imagination and creating worlds and trying to love, but I'm well aware while I'm writing that it might not, I might not have the, the reception, it might not be possible for it to be received in a way because the other works that I would like to be standing on the shoulders of aren't being recognized yet. Um, so I do that writing with that knowledge and then I write the essays, I think probably because I'm trying to encourage um, 
the development of this context. So for example, when there was a, a debate which emerged in Germany and I think in Europe actually about the translation of Amanda Gorman's poem, the big poem that she read at Joe Biden's inauguration. And um, there was a debate that happened around that because of this um, question about whether black translators could also translate this poem, right? And this, this um, discussion was reduced very quickly to, oh, so does it mean that white people can't translate black people? No one ever said that, but that's what the debate was reduced to. So one thing I did do, for example, is to write an essay where I reiterated the original point of criticism and then gave many other aspects to consider when discussing this question. And that's a lot of work actually. And I think that that's just the way it has to be for now. I think. Thank you. Yeah, I actually have a comment on that, but maybe let's hear the question. Okay, there's two questions from the audience. Shall I ask them both at once? Is that okay? Yeah. So one question from Andrew. Um, could you say something about why you chose to shape the narrative through various non-human perspectives, a room or a passport, for instance? And the second question from Rebecca, do you have any advice for aspiring writers who are also writing in their second language? Do you still write in English sometimes or mix German and English in your writings? Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> so Andrew's question, hello Andrew. I, I get asked that question a lot and I always say I don't really like answering it because it's a bit like explaining the punchline <laughs> <laughs> of a joke that I think is brilliant, but I love it. this is what happened. So often I won't answer it, but just to say, I think that um, using a, a voice that is neither clearly a victim nor clearly a perpetrator gives the opportunity to do a bit more with the narrative and to explore more things. And what I wanted to do very clearly is to talk about um, the role of um, people who bear witness, which can be done as an object in my book anyway. And the reason that that was so relevant at the time, I think at the time when I was writing, there's so many to choose. There was some tragedy going on and there's still ongoing tragedy. So it's not even unrelevant now. But I remember thinking, what does my writing, what can I achieve with my writing at this terrible time? Whatever terrible time was happening. And um, yeah, I'm not the person who's gonna go out single-handedly and rescue people from drowning or go to Moria and, and uh, get them out of the camps. I'm not going to do that, that's not in my power. But what I can do is talk about what's happening and draw attention to what's happening and, and think about collectively ways, how can I contribute to work that's already being done to try to redress this, this, uh, this grievance. And so I think the role of being a witness is something like people I could imagine feel really helpless right now about, for example, the situation in Ukraine. But um, we at least have that we at least have the possibility to bear witness. So that's that's one thing that this object narrator can do. Um, and to people who are writing in a language that's not their first language is, um, my advice is to just keep going. And <clears throat> we're not choosing to do that because of an easy option, right? It's a very difficult thing to do. And that's why, even if you find it difficult, there is a reason why you decided to start doing it and to pursue that reason and not to be discouraged. When I first wrote <clears throat> and was showing it to people, I actually got the feedback from one person that maybe I should consider rewriting the story in English and then getting someone to translate it for me because it didn't quite sound, <laughs> didn't quite sound German. I'm like, yeah, but that was the point. I don't want it to sound German. <laughs> So yeah, don't listen to people who are kind of conservative and set in their ways. Go with the avant garde. That's why. There's another one. Okay. Oh, there's another two. <laughs> um, I'll go with the one that came in first, and, and from Iloma. The uh, and it links to that actually. The advert from Shamiso Literary Prize for writers whose mother tongue is not German but writing German has been discontinued because the funders thought that it had fulfilled its goal. Do you think this work has been completed? Oh, that's a good question. 
Okay, first of all, no, I don't think it's been completed. And what would that look like? Why did they think it's been completed? I don't know. Um, all right, I don't think so because I don't I don't see that. Like there there will always be people who are learning to speak German and learning the language for the first time or what have you, and then those people will be able to write and I assume that that would be nice for them to get recognition for their work in that category. I thought about that prize a lot um, back in the day, and I thought I'd feel really weird if I received that prize. I wouldn't. I think also a reason why it was discontinued is actually this kind of, yeah, this othering yeah. Um, kind of mechanic to single out yeah, writers uh, whose I, language is not German. There was, a, I think, also, it, it, I might be wrong, I have to go back and look at it again, but I think that also it was pretty arbitrary at what point you were classified as a writer, right? So if you really had literally only learned German for a year, fair enough, but if you've been learning German actually your whole life, but you just happen to be non white, why are you being nominated for a prize for people who don't? I didn't get it. But, um, I understand because the year that I was in um, Klagenfurt doing my Herr Grotzutsetzi here in text, Tomagadi was also mm -hmm. there. And Tomagadi is an Israeli writer who deliberately works with what he calls broken German. In fact, his first novel is called Broken German. And, and that was a deliberate, it's so fantastic what he does. And now he's one of he yes. won the Leipzig um, Book Prize. And, that shows, right, that they understood this year finally what he was doing. But in Klagenfurt, when they were discussing his text, it was like, oh, well, <laughs> comma fehler here. Like, <laughs> comma mistakes. And he didn't put the capital on the first noun. What the, is this German? They said. And they were discussing, it was so rude. They were this, oh, I'm on television, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> they were discussing his text and say he doesn't speak German. And poor Toma was sitting there going, actually, I understand every word. <laughs> so he doesn't speak German the way they spoke German. Yes. But clearly he was doing something. And if you think about it, an Israeli descended from um, Jewish Germans who have been forced to leave their country, their home, go to Israel, and then the descendant comes back speaking broken German. It's a non-brainer, actually, what he was doing. Um, and it took until now, seven years later, for the people actually to give him the recognition. I'm shouting. <laughs> I'm so okay. <laughs> yeah, but I would have thought it was problematic. Well, I wasn't going for... I wasn't going for that. I wanted to write German, you know. I wanted to be recognized as a as a writer, and not as someone who does very well with her. <laughs> that I think that's a kind of award wise identity politics thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I just talked to Abbas Khidr a few weeks ago, who also won that award. Ah, okay. Yes. Yeah. I think it was the last one to to get it, and. He has never been nominated for a normal right. prize. Yeah. So yeah. Really. yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But there was another question. There yeah. is. Do we have time? Yeah, one more. Okay, so from um Mahamadou, who has another question about to the the um basin. Um I one question about the eye voice, which takes different shapes. So the broom, the door knocker, um, the room, the breeze, the uh, the passport. Um, and um, which cross also different narrative times of the novel. This voice even enters into dialogue with God. How would you explain the relation of this voice with the character God in the novel and its role in the whole novel? What? <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready to explain my book? <laughs> um, how would I explain how? Thanks to God. <laughs> Do I have to answer? No, you can ask answer this one instead. What's, okay. your, new, what's your new writing project? <laughs> I'd rather answer the other one. <laughs> well done, audience. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I can say this. I think I can say this. So I'm writing Adas Ram, and I have this idea that. One of, the, one of the stories that's happening in Adas Ram is that this reason, this being wants to become a human being. And it's like, why can't I become a human being? And, and you follow 
the discussions and part of the discussions we've got around this question of what else do I have to do and why do I, why am I in room and I have, I'm being forced to witness um, these horrible things going on. And um, there is a statement about, yeah, there's a statement in the novel about love that, that the, the being says, um, I can be something that makes people happy, but I can't be something that generates the feeling of love. That's the thing that's only for God, yeah? And then at some point towards the end of the novel, there is a quote, and I can't remember exactly how it goes, but the being says, the ability to bear witness is perhaps the strongest proof of love of all, right? And that, if you're reading very, very closely, academics, <laughs> um, is, the, is the plot point where the being becomes able to show love. And because the being achieves that, the being can then become a human being. And that's all. Of, that's when the rest of the story happens. For those of them. So, okay, and what am I working on? I'm working on, um, I want to write a novel which would be set in 1972 in Germany. And <clears throat> 1972 is a particularly interesting period. I find uh, that was the year I was born, but that's not the reason it's interesting. <laughs> because um, that was kind of the roundabout the time when the pill became widely available, which changed the way that relationships worked in hetero couples, like suddenly the women had a lot more autonomy, or could have, could have a lot more autonomy. Um, and I'm looking at a married couple who between them will tell several generations of black German history. He's a US American GI, who had already been in Germany before during the uh, Olympics <clears throat> when uh, Jesse Owen won. Mm -hmm. And she is uh, the daughter of a uh, Cameroonian. Um, and so there's this whole story about German colonialism and surviving the war. And so, so that's, hey. that's that so far. <laughs> hey. <laughs> I think this is a really good point to end here. We are all intrigued <laughs> and want to read this novel. Um, thank you so much, Sharon. You're very welcome. Thank and, you. And um, yeah, we're going to discuss literal, uh, literary activism now behind the scenes. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for all these interesting questions. And thank you again for having me.